Okay, uh, thank you so much for coming. I hope you enjoyed your break. Um, and we continue with topology, and obviously I hope we will enjoy topology. Uh, so today is actually one of my favorite topics. I have plenty of favorite topics, uh, you will see that. Um, but this one is really cool actually, and we will spend the whole lecture of trying to understand it a little bit better. And it's this notion of a connected sum, but uh, so that's, that's just a name, whatever it is. Um, but you really should think of it as like a version of multiplication. Well, it's, it's called sum, so it looks like a version of uh, summation, but it's actually a version of multiplication. And it's, it's, it's really fun. So if you learn multiplication, well, very early on, uh, it always looks a bit scary. You need to uh, learn the timetables or whatever. Um, and it will look a little bit the same here, but we have a multiplication on our favorite objects, which is kind of fantastic, because if you just think about this, we have kind of a multiplication structure, so that's very good. So what does multiplication do for you? So if you have something like uh, two times five, and I hope nobody will be very uh, lost if I write that this is 10. Um, so what does it do? Is it takes two inputs, um, I guess two and five, and it gives a new object of the same type. And it takes two numbers and gives a new number. So that's what our multiplication does. And then it satisfies some standard properties, right? Like it's commutative or whatever. Um, so it is actually really nice to have those type of operations on whatever type of spaces you study. So you take two spaces, two spaces that you like very much. You have some operation that gives you another space of the same type. And that's just really useful. And we can do that with surfaces. And that's just really, really, really nice. And the name is called connected sum. But I really would like to think of you to think of it like as a multiplication type of object. And it, it's really what it says right now on the slide. We want to build new surfaces from old. Well, we want to build new numbers from old. And the, the upshot in the end is that we only need to study some basic prime numbers. And we can somehow uh, describe all surfaces. So in some sense, having multiplication tells you that you, in, in some sense, obviously, you don't need to study all numbers. You only need to study prime numbers, kind of the basic building blocks of uh, the story. And it will turn out to be like very, very similar in, in our setting, which is, is, is kind of really beautiful. Um, so yeah, we will spend the rest of the lecture trying to understand this operation. It's really beautiful. So let's, um, let me give you an example. OK, so we have two surfaces. S and D. So what could we do to create a new surface? Well, a priori, we don't know much about S and we don't know much about T. Um, but what we could do, so this new surface, here's a jargon, is denoted by hash. So the operation is not times, it's a multiplication, or plus as addition, but then it's denoted hash. Fine. It's just a symbol. So what is this hash, uh, S hash T? Well, what can we do? We have a surface S and T. And the only thing we know is that it has locally, both of them have locally a disk somewhere. OK, that's what we know. So why not take those disks and just put them together, right? So just build a bridge between them, something like this. And we would get I have a, a nicer picture in a second. And we would get uh, a new type of surface, which we could then call uh, S, funny symbol, hash, and T. Right? So the only thing we know about our surfaces is they have locally disks. So why not use the disk and kind of glue them together? And we should get something that still has locally disks, because we kind of don't touch anything uh, on the outside. OK. And it, that's exactly the definition. So we take those disks, we kind of cut them out, and then build the bridge between them. So take some disk, and we always know they exist. Locally, we always have uh, some of those disks. And just make an annulus between them, something like this. Right, so identify those, just pick, pick this one, pick this one, pull them out and glue them together. Right? So pick this one here, pick this one here, pull them together, and then stack them together. And this gives you a new surface, which we call, uh, as I said, S. So the, the, everything that you see here now is S hash T. It's kind of a fun operation if you just think about it. So you have two surfaces as an input, and you get another one um, as an output. And it's really just putting a cylinder between them, like taking those, poke your fingers into the surface. You can always do that, because locally, there's a, there's a disk. 
pull out the ends and glue them together. So let's do it once more. Uh, poke your finger into the surface and now take the ends, take this end, take this end, pull them out and glue them together in the middle. And what you get is a picture that kind of looks like this. And that's by definition the connected sum. And as I said, this is like multi multiplying those two surfaces. S times T, so two times five is 10, and S hash T is S hash T. Um, yeah, so this is actually a pretty cool operation on surfaces, kind of very intuitive. It's the only thing you really can do because you kind of don't want to mess around with the surface. It could be any kind of crazy surface, but you always know there's locally a disk. So you just take that disk, poke it out, and just glue it together with, with another disk from the other side. This is called um, the connected sum. Okay, so let's go through some examples. Okay, so what is, well, S2, S2, remember, is a sphere. I have it in a second, so this was the soccer ball. And we, we want to put another soccer ball next to it. And what we want to do is we want to poke in a hole and connect them together. And what will we get? Okay, that's exactly the question. Okay, so let's see. So this is exactly the picture I had before, a little bit nicer, I guess. Um, so we poked in a hole and have now this little cylinder uh, connecting them. And I will completely focus on the right-hand side. So I, I will leave DS as, sorry, I leave S as it is, the left-hand side as it is, and I will just massage the right-hand side. And what we can do, well, look at the picture. There's a lot of air inside of the T here. So this is T, let's say this is T and this is S. There's a little of air in the T, so we can just shrink it in. So let's do that. We just shrink it in, and we shrink it in even more. Right? We just pull out the, the air, blow it into S, from T into S, and then we can just pull in the whole cylinder itself. Like this, this whole beast is just kind of poking out a little bit and just uh, push it in again. Right? So this picture here essentially is just something that looks like this, um, and you just we just grab the end and just pull it in. So uh, a sphere, hash a sphere, is a sphere. It's kind of interesting. So here's S2 again. So if you hash S2 to a sphere, so you get a sphere again. Okay, and I will, I will always say hash for this operation, for the obvious reason that is denoted by hash. Um, yeah, so S, S2 hash S2 is S2. And actually, if you think about this argument, well, let's do it again. So maybe here was S, here was T, and I actually never touched S, right? So look at the picture, I never touch S, I blow out of air, air out of T and push it into S. So S could be anything. S is any crazy surface. God knows what it is. Uh, so here's my S. And T is the sphere. Here's my sphere. And we now poke a hole into both. Maybe I should give the hole in a different color. Uh, what is a good one? Maybe green. Give the hole a different color and put a cylinder in between them and then play the same game. This is T. Squeeze in T, push it into S, and you will see that T hash S2 is T. Right? It's the same, same argument, just replace the left hand side by uh, a black box denoting any type of arbitrary surface. So, what have we done? Well, we have just verified that the one, right, one times, uh, so here let me write it down, so maybe we need a little bit more space. Um, this was exactly the same calculation. So one times A is A, as you all know, and, uh, well, I read, wrote it the wrong way, wrong way around, so let me try again. Um, of course, it's the same, but right now we don't know that. So A times one is A, so A is T, right, so numbers, S2 is one, so it's the same equation. So the role, one place for multiplication, our best friend, the soccer ball, place for this hash operation. It's the unit under that operation. It's, a, it's the one element under that operation. Whatever you do, putting S, S2 to a surface will always give the surface back. That's what a unit does. And I, I think this is really beautiful. The argument is pretty easy. You just blow the air out of T, um, of the ball T, and, and that's essentially it, and push it in. I know this feels a little bit weird, but remember when you learned multiplication for the first time, it also felt a bit weird. It's kind of the same. We are trying to set up a timetable here, uh, so we're doing some multiplication, and it turns out that 
the sphere is the unit element under uh, this hashy operation. Really, it was really cute, actually. <laughs> okay, what do you do if you learn multiplication? We need to do some more examples. So now we take a disk. Okay, be careful here. This is a disk, not a ball. So here's some. I, I can't. I can't pull my put my hand through. Right, there's a disk looking at me, but I play the same game. I have a disk, and I have a disk, and I pull in a hole into both, and I connect them, which is this picture up here. So what is this? Well, let's try. So now this, the, the right-hand side is uh, very solid, and I again won't touch the left-hand side. So again, my argument will actually work for any type of surface on the left, but let's start with uh, d hash d. Okay, so what can we do? Well, let's try the following. We can still shrink it, let's just, just shrink it like before. We don't, it's, it's a little bit different than the operation pulling, pulling air out of it. Um, and then the following happens. So if you just think of it, so here you have a, a little tube, and now there's a little disc glued out on the outside here, like, like in this picture up here. So you can just pull it inwards, and it's actually just a tube. I hope that makes some sense. There's this disk sitting there, but it has a hole, so you take it and pull it so that the hole is just sticking out and, and the remaining uh, skin of the, of, the, of the disk, you just pull it away. Okay, uh, so now everything is just a little point, so you just pull that in. You have a little cylinder, you just pull it in, and you now have a hole in your surface. Right? So let's do that again. We start with a picture. We want to we ask the question, what is it? Well, we shrink it again. But now shrinking is a little bit different than pulling out air, um, because now it's kind of, there is already a hole, right? You can, here's a hole. So you can actually go through, and you just take the skin of the disk and bend it away until you see the cylinder. And the cylinder is just, you just squeeze it in. It's gone. And you get a, a hole in your surface. Oh, very interesting calculation. So it's essentially this one, right? Make the hole a little bit bigger, and it's an annulus. So disk tends on the, the disk the hash disk is actually an annulus. That was fun. So it's an annulus, right? So the disk hash disk is an annulus, and all we did is again the shrinking operation. It's really beautiful, and then just pull it in again. And as you've noticed, hopefully that was reasonably clear. Here's S. Here's T. And I had never touched S at all, right? The only thing I did is I massaged T a bit, I pushed it in, and then there was a hole in S. The same argument works if I replace S by any kind of object, whatever it is. I never touched it anyway. Put in my disk here, uh, connect the two, flip, flip, take the disk, push it in, and I get an, an extra hole on S. So the the, the sphere is a unit under this operation, and the disk puts a hole in your surface. So it, it pokes the surface. Right? So it punctures the surface, uh, puts a hole into the surface. Oh, that's funny. So um, maybe the two easiest spaces, they do something kind of, kind of, kind of nice. So S2 uh, is just a unit. It does, does nothing if you want. And this one just pokes a hole into the surface, so you get an, um, an extra hole in your surface. In particular, just having this object and this operation, we can create arbitrary holes in surfaces, because if you want five holes, you just repeat this operation five times, and you get five holes in your surface. So you can kind of replace the operation of having holes by just knowing what hash of the disk does. That's like really like the prime decomposition. Instead of studying uh, large numbers, you study its prime factors, and you can always compose the large factors, uh, the large numbers from its prime factors. We just did the same here. Right? And now we can put holes in surfaces by repeating the operation. Right? So in particular, if you do that d, d times, <laughs> then you have d holes in your surface. So um, let's say d is 2, then for example, uh, the torus hash 2, d2, would be, well, maybe I need a bit of color, would be this object, a torus, with two new holes. Right? You have punctured it twice. 
And you can do that arbitrarily often. So you can put punctures in your space. And I will always write um, this hash to the D for applying it D times. Because that's what we want to do. We want to kind of find a prime number decomposition of surfaces. So eventually, I would like to write a, a number as prime number times prime number times prime number. And here, we want to write a surface as some easy surfaces hashed together. Right? The prime number decomposition of our space. Really, really, an absolutely beautiful idea. Right? It's just adding the boundary circle. We already found two nice operations that are not, not really difficult and they're really easy to prove. You just take it, bend it open, and uh, push it inwards. Okay. Um, what does this operation do? So T hash T, so you put a torus next to a torus, or you put any surface next to a torus. Um, what it really does, there's not much happening, it just puts them together and you get an extra handle. So if I would have started, for example, with a with S2, so here's S2, uh, and I would put in a torus, and now I would like to think of shrinking, shrinking the uh, disk side, this is T, this is S. The only thing that happens is that I have now a little handle, this is a bad picture, let me try again, that I have now a little handle on my surface. So hashing with a disk creates holes, hashing with a torus creates those little handles, like you have a coffee cup, those guys. And you can just put them on the surface. And you can replace your surface here on the left-hand side by anything. You just add those little uh, handles together. And this object actually has a name. It's called a double torus. In general, it will just be a d times torus, so triple torus. Uh, hashing a d times, you put a handle on 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 a handle. Yeah, you get the point. We get the OK, I call it T. You get the uh, T tori by just hashing enough numbers together. And hashing enough tori together. I already have my analogy with numbers running here. Hashing enough tori together. Uh, you could create handles on surfaces. Right? It's pretty cool. So we can create uh, holes, and we can create handles. Do we, need, we only need one more, and that's kind of fantastic. So in this case, it will turn out that we only need three prime numbers. And the decomposition has only three factors, um, up to powers, right? You can also have, um, remember that in the prime number decomposition, you can also have powers, something like this. Um, but here, in this case, we will only have three prime numbers in the end. One of them will be the disk. One of them will be the torus. And there's one more. Uh, and it, it's sadly not an easy surface. It is the projective plane. Uh, well, you can't avoid it. It's just what it is. But we'll see that also. So here they are. And if you think of them as a polygon, um, the torus, so I will explain that later again. The torus is just the polygon upstairs. The double torus is the eight gun. So torus is the, sorry, the, 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 the eight gun. And the torus is a four gun. The next one is a 12 gun glued together in, in this fashion. So whenever you see this pattern, so be, be aware this will happen all the time somewhere. So the A, B, A inverse, B inverse, it's here again, for example, A, B, A inverse, B inverse, and it's just relabeled here again. I just relabeled it. This is the handle in your surface. So if you see a, a polygon and you see this pattern, you know it's a handle. So you know that's a torus in your surface. And we'll try to make this more precise. We make that more precise later. But for now, these are just these objects. And you can kind of think of the gluing of those curves, I just illustrated them I'm here on those tori. Okay, fine. So the next one is projective plane. That's a bit difficult. Let me push it away for a second. And let me explain to you why I would like to call this multiplication. So what is so fantastic about multiplication is that it has some properties. So we should somehow um, justify why I would like to call this multiplication. So first thing, we kind of want to show that this is, this is kind of well defined. So if you think about it, what I've told you is you take your surface and you take your other surface here and you push in a hole somewhere, whatever, and a hole somewhere else, whatever, and then connect them. And that's what we call the hash operation, the S hash T. It would be really shit. It would be really shit if this would depend on the choice of where you poke your surface. Right? That would be really bad. 
because then we would have a kind of a whole family of those beasts, depending where you poke your surface. And um, turns out that this is independent, of, so we can just poke it anywhere. And turns out again that the proof is absolutely cute. So let's do it. So why is this independent of where you poke your surface? Well, let's do it. So here's a picture. I poked surface S and I poked surface T somewhere and I pulled it together. Um, but what I could also do is, well, I could have poked them here, which is really just moving the cylinder around, right? The same thing. I just moved it around. I could have poked them here, I, and I just moved my cylinder continuously around, right? I could have poked them here, and it's always the same. No, nothing really changes. I, I just move my cylinder around. Well, let's do it again. Could have poked them here, could have poked them here, here, or here, or wherever, and I always get uh, the same answer. So this is independent of the location where we poke our surfaces, which is fantastic, because otherwise th this would be a pretty shitty operation. It's okay. good. So this is, this is, this is fantastic. Um, here's another property. It's commutative. Huh? So S, ha S hash T is the same as T, S and T hash S. Reminds us of multiplication. It's commutative. Can we see that as a beautiful proof again? Okay. You just take your S hash T and your T S hash, and you just take it and turn it, turn it around. Right? You just take it in your hand, turn S, bring S to here, and bring T to here. Just turn the picture around, and of course, the thing you have in your hand doesn't change. You just rotated it uh, a little bit around. So it is a well-defined operation, and it is commutative. That's already fantastic. That should remind you of multiplication. So it makes sense to study it, and it's even commutative. And the arguments are pretty simple. It's got a really, really beautiful operation. Good. This is another property uh, multiplication satisfies. It's called associativity. Can we do that? Can we see that, actually? Um, yes, we can. It's actually not so difficult. <laughs> so essentially, it's this picture. So whether you kind of uh, bracket this way around, or you bracket this way around, right? Doing d d two and three first, doing those first, doing those second, it doesn't change anything. It's the same surface. It doesn't doesn't make any difference. So this check is just like really easy again. But of course we want to do it because now it justifies to call it a uh, multiplication. The only thing that is missing compared to standard multiplication, if you want, is that you can't invert surfaces. So um, what is inverse of a torus? There is no inverse of a torus. Fine. But otherwise, it's kind of a, a very, very nice multiplication on surfaces. Right? I hope this makes sense. I just it's just the same picture. It just it doesn't matter in which way I do it. Okay, so that's why I call this multiplication. It has exactly the same properties, and arbitrary bracketings work in the same way. It's really, really beautiful structure. Right? And we want to play our prime number game, and it makes sense to do it. It's like really like multiplication. Um, so in case, so this is one of my favorite multiplication structures ever. It's, it's even, somehow even easier than uh, multiplying numbers. As we will see, I said it again, um, we only have three prime numbers in this case, if you want. So it's kind of really simple in the end. Okay. Um, some people call this addition. That's why I call it, it's called direct sum, a uh, connected sum, but it, whatever you prefer, whether it's addition or multiplication. But it really is some kind of structure of that form. Cool. Let's do another one. So can we prove that? Um, probably very, very simple. So how does Euler characteristic behave? Euler characteristic, I told you, is like really important. So we want to know how does it behave under hash. And it's very simple. It almost turns hash into addition, but this is off, off by two factor. So there's a minus two sticking around. And I will show you why we want this minus two. It actually really makes sense. Um, because if you, well, take S2 and hash it with something, whatever, T, what you should get is T, right? So that's what we said. This is T. So the equation upstairs should spit out chi of T, right? And it does because chi of S2 happens to be exactly this number minus 2, uh, 2, sorry, not minus 2. So these two will cancel out. 
and the equation will be just S2 hash T is, uh, chi of S2 hash T is chi of T. So the minus two is really a fact, comes from this one being the identity. And we'll see that in the proof. Okay, but it's a really simple formula. It's actually pretty beautiful, right? It's essentially what you would do, you would pull it out, but you have a, have a price to pay, and the price is not, not that large, it's just a minus two that you have to keep around. Cool, so how would you prove that? Um, so here's S, here's T. Essentially, I haven't touched S, and most of it stays what it is, so most of its polygon decomposition that we use to compute the Euler characteristic will just stay what it is. Similarly for T, and we can only focus on the local part that changes. So what we have done is we have put in a disk, uh, we've put in a hole, and you just do it as a polygon. So here's a hole as a polygon. Huh? It's just A, B, C, so three vertices, uh, and three edges, and one missing face, because I poked it out. Same on the other side. Huh? That's what I just did, I poked it out. You do the calculation, so you poked out this guy, the three minus three plus one, the missing, the plus one is the missing face. You do it on the other side, three minus three plus one. And the rest is just uh, algebra autopilot. You just put it together. Wh whatever those numbers are, they will add up to uh, chi of two. So the minus two really comes from cutting out those two disks. So that's, that's what happens. And we never touch anything else. So that's why we can just say um, on, on the other part, the chi uh, of S and F of T, they just stay the same. Right? Now you just factor it out and you get the equation upstairs. But again, pretty simple actually. Right? Just do it uh, kind of with some topological intuition. An absolutely wonderful operation. Okay, so let's do some calculations. So the first one, I already did it. I just called the surface T on the previous slide. So chi of S is chi of S plus chi of S squared minus two by the hash operation. And the date constant perfectly. Uh, that's why this needs to be uh, the unit here. Well, maybe I should do it a little bit better. This one constant is this one. And that's why you get this one. So if you want to know what the hash, it's always really simple, it's beautiful. So if you want to know what the Euler characteristic is, and you already have it in hash form, you just apply that formula. Let's say you want to compute the Euler characteristic of an annulus, and you know that it's, it's a disk and a disk. So you just apply that formula. Disk has Euler characteristic one, so this is one. This is one again. And the only thing you need to do is you need to subtract two, because remember, that's the price you pay. One plus one minus two, and you're done. No further calculation needed. You want to know what the Euler characteristic of the triple torus is. Again, here's the triple torus down here. Um, and you just repeat that operation. Right? So I just wrote down the formula for one iteration, but S could, could be itself a, a hash of something. So you can iterate that iter uh, operation several times as, as often as you want. So chi t this is just this. Do it once, you pay a factor minus two. Do it twice. You pay a factor minus two, and all our characteristic of the torus was zero. So, oh, I maybe should have written this. So this one is zero, this one is zero, this one is zero. So the only thing that remains is what's supposed to be a zero. The only thing that remains is the minus two minus two is minus four. Right? And now you can imagine you have some large hash space, and you know the Euler characteristic for our prime factors, which you haven't, haven't quite determined yet, but they are the disk and the torus, the disk has all our characteristic one, the torus has all our characteristic zero. You can just compute everything. Right? You can just compute the all our characteristic from that formula. I hope that's reasonably clear. So the formula is like really, really powerful. You only always have to subtract two. Remember always to subtract uh, two. Absolutely cute, very nice. Cool, so I'm, I will finish off by showing you uh, how hash looks on polygons because we have those two pictures. We have surfaces, which I just draw, usually like, like this. Here, exercise, draw a surface, here's one. Um, and there's a polygon decomposition, which, is, which are those flat pictures that you see upstairs. So remember, the torus is always um, this type of pattern, so A, B, A inverse, B inverse. No matter how you call them, whether they're called A or B or C or D, it doesn't matter. So how does a hash operation on them look like? 
Well, let's have a look how it looks like. The torus torus should be, well, maybe I should have drawn a nicer surface. Torus torus should be double torus. Here's the normal surface. So let's see how it works. Bash. And what you do is, so here I have a hash symbol in the middle. Note that, here's a hash in the middle. Here's no hash anymore. So I already did the operation. And the only thing I did is I poked my finger here by adding an extra edge and I identify along that edge. Right? The edge E here is new. So really, if I exit here, I re-enter here. And this is really what is going on here is I have a little torus up here and I have a little torus up here. And this little edge E is the boundary of this torus. And all we do is I hide the cylinder in the polygon because coming out here, going in here, is the same as saying there's a connection between them, and that's essentially our little cylinder uh, connecting the two. Right? So hashing on a polygon is also a very easy operation. You bring in an extra edge and identify along that edge. Okay, and if you now pull it together, well, there you go, we get the pattern we expect, the A, B, A inverse, B inverse, followed by the same pattern just relabeled which was our um, double torus type thing. So one of those guys here is whatever, let's say the upper one, and the other one is the lower part of the picture, and they're glued together along E, and uh, this is a bad color, they're glued together, together along E, and E would be here, sitting around here, right? That's all I did. I just turned the picture like a little bit to the side. It's really easy. What a fantastic operation. It's also really easy on, on polygons. You put in an edge and collect along that edge. No? And we can really do it anywhere. In particular, I can now do it for the projective plane because I'm, I'm really scared of drawing the projective plane as a surface. But as a polygon, it's actually not so bad. It's just a double edge AA that you identify. And another copy of it is a double edge BB. No? And what you do is... So what is projective plane, hash projective plane? Well, it's the following. You glue in this thing here, and it's the same as putting in an extra edge and putting it together along that edge. Right? So C here is my cylinder, and I have a projective plane which I can't draw sitting at the top, and I have one sitting at the bottom, and they're glued along, uh, along that C. So this guy here is C. C is sitting here. This one is C. Right? So that's what I did. It's the same operation, I just did it one faster one step faster, uh, because I don't have enough uh, space on the slide, there will be something coming below here. Um, yeah, so AABB, okay. So if you glue AABB together, you get AABB, and I'm reading, I'm just reading that thing here in some, some order. Huh? So I, I started with AA hash BB, and I get AABB could be a pattern, and it's indeed not really difficult. It turns out that the projective plane, um, so it's just really this one, is really easy under hash. It's a very difficult surface, so don't try to really draw it, but it's really easy under this operation, because it will do the following for you. So if you do it three times, you get AABBCC. Right? If you do it four times, you will get AABBCCDD. If you do it five times, Whatever the next number, uh, whatever the next letter is, A A B B C C D D E. It's really easy. It turns out that the, the probably most complicated surface behaves quite nicely uh, as a polygon under the hash operation, and this one will be our um, remaining prime number. Right? Not so bad. So this prime number is very easy. It just adds kind of a copy of A A into your surface. Hmm. A bit more difficult to imagine as a surface, so that's why I'm doing it on the polygon. Okay, well, that's pretty easy. So what is disk? Disk. So notice here that I'm going through our prime numbers, right? Torus, disk, and projective plane. And then just explain uh, what they do on, on the polygons. So here's this disk. This disk is a bit annoying. You cut them in and you glue them together along edge E. I, so here's our disk now at the top, and here's our disk at the bottom. You glue them together and you get this really difficult picture. So it's very interesting somewhat. It, it, I mean, you can still describe it, it's not so bad. Um, 
But it turns out that the most complicated surface that does something really complicated if you try to build it out of clay has a very easy pattern, the projective plane, and kind of the easiest type of surface is a little bit delicate on the polygon. We can still describe it. It's not, it's not super terribly difficult. But anyway. Okay. A bit difficult. Okay. Um, yeah, so that was essentially the story about connected sums. There's one more. And then we are ready to write down a, a prime number decomposition of surfaces. And I said again, the prime numbers will be the disk, the torus, and the projective plane. And the operation will be the hash operation. So everything, kind of spoiler, everything can be written as a hash operation of uh, tori, projective planes, and disks. Which is kind of a fantastic statement. It gives us a really cute way to think about surfaces because now we just have a prime number decomposition. Somehow much easier because our prime numbers are, let's say, just two, three, and five, and there are no other prime numbers. So everything is built out of two, uh, three, and five. In order to do so, I want to recall um, the two basic operations which we will always use to massage surfaces. And they're actually really easy. Um, so we can do this one. You could cut in the surface and then just pull it open. So if you cut into the surface and pull it open, right? if you identify from the right-hand side to the left-hand side, that's exactly what you do. That's the surface that you bend it in. And that's um, adding moving edges. So that's one operation. And there's another operation. And that's just uh, this one here, the cutting and gluing. That's what I did all the time. It's just a reminder well, that uh, these are the two basic operations. So I did that on the, on the previous slides all the time. They will never change the surface. Right, I can cut it in the middle, and now I have two pictures. Remember that this really means if I go out here, I come in here, which really is just crossing it um, over here. And these are the only operations you ever need. I just reminded you what they are, and they were called uh, surgery. So the jargon is surgery. One of them is a gluing operation. One of them is adding an edge operation. Cool. And whenever I massage a polygon, every little step will be one of those. So that's why I pulled this up again. Kind of really easy. On polygons, you only have two operations. So these are essentially everything we ever need. So if you're scared about polygons, um, I hope you're not, because they are pretty cute. Uh, but there are only two operations we will ever do on them anyway. So it's not so bad. Good. Back to the main story. And I give this a lemma. I give this a formal lemma, because this one is kind of really interesting. Um, the Möbius strip is actually hashing a projective plane and a disk together. Uh, so in some sense, a Möbius strip is a punctured projective plane because a disk, sorry, a disk puts a, puts a hole into your surface. And why is that interesting? Before I show you how that works, why is that interesting? Well, because we said a surface is non-orientable if it contains a Möbius strip. But now, since the Möbius strip is a disk and a projective plane, this is kind of equivalent to containing a projective plane. Okay? So it turns out that non-orientable surfaces are exactly those where the prime number decomposition contains a projective plane. And that's why we want them um, in our prime number decomposition. This theorem will, will tell you that this is the case, because you can always replace a Möbius strip uh, by a projective plane and a disk. Ooh, okay, so here's our Möbius strip. Um, so identify along BB, and A and C are just the boundary component of the Möbius strip. Remember that you identify this with a twist. That's why it points down and up. And I want to get out a hash out of this. So let's see. Okay. And there's one operation I can do. I can cut it. Remember, that's what we just did. And I can rearrange the cut by uh, just cut it, uh, cut it out and then doing the, uh, the edge operation. And if you just identify A and C, with, with just put it together into one edge and call it E, right? So I just, all I do is I say those two edges, they, they kind of glue together, and they, I could just call this one E. Then that's what I get. And 
That's a projective plane with a boundary component. So here's our projective plane. Remember, that's just two symbols in a row, and it has a little uh, boundary component that's called E. So this is really, so this guy here is our projective plane, and this guy here is really just one E. So when, if it's just one E, it's really just a disk. So this is our disk here. The only thing you need to remember about projective planes is that in a polygon, they are always something like this, a DD thing. So as soon as you see a DD or an AA or whatever relabeled BB, there's a projective plane in your surface. So whenever you see um, the AB, A inverse, B inverse, that was a handle, a torus, this is a standard picture of a projective plane, uh, just two symbols in a row. Awesome. Okay, there you go. Disk, hash, projective plane. Well, that was already written upstairs, but what is the point? I say it again. Every non or remember non orientable, recall non orientable was defined by containing a Mobius strip, but now we know that's the same as containing a projective plane in a certain type of way because the Mobius strip is just a projective plane with a hole. So we can write, and for every, this is really saying, if you think about it in terms of the, uh, the prime number decomposition, this is really saying, as soon as you have a non-oriented surface, it contains a projective plane uh, in its prime number decomposition, and as soon as you have something that contains a projective plane in its prime number decomposition, it's non-orientable. So this is an if and only if, actually. So the projective plane is our, is our witness, our test candidate for uh, non-orientability. So this is really important. Yeah. So the projective plane, we somehow can't avoid it. I'm, I'm very sorry, it's just really difficult. Um, not on the polygon. I always like to stress that on the polygon it's really easy. It's just two numbers in a row, AA, BB, DD, whatever it is. Um, but as a surface itself, it's quite difficult. To imagine, but it, it's kind of really important. It, it picks out exactly those non orientable ones, and these are the crazy ones that only exist essentially in four space. And kind of is somewhat explained by this sentence here because the projective plane is so difficult and it needs actually four space to exist. There's one more, and then I, I let you go. And this one is like a lot of fun. Um, so the Klein bottle itself is a hash of a projective plane. Right? So the Klein bottle in its prime number decomposition would, is projective plane times projective plane. Essentially what I'm writing down right now are um, the prime number decompositions of, of our favorite surfaces. So we know what the annual, I had the annulus, it was disk, disk, and the torus is a prime number. Uh, I had the Mobius strip, that's disk projective plane, and here's a Klein bottle, it's projective plane, projective plane. Yeah. And all we ever need to know in the end is the prime number decomposition of a surface. Okay, so what can we do? We just try it. Um, so let's try. So here's our Klein bottle. Um, remember this is this pattern, so AB, A inverse B, not quite the torus because B and B are twisted here. That was the Klein bottle where you took the annulus, wrap it around, and then identify it twisted. Okay, we do our usual trick. It's exactly the same calculation as before. And you can already see what's happening now. We have an A, an a and a CC, and each one of them is a copy uh, of the projective plane. They're just rearranging. The, and I only used the, the basic surgery operations that we've seen before. So the Klein bottle is twice the projective plane. Okay. Prime number decomposition of number four is two times two. Prime number decomposition of Klein is projective and projective. Oh, very beautiful. Um, oh, I have one more, and then, then, then you're good to go. <laughs> Promise, this is the last one. Um, we'll see. <laughs> Okay, um, torus hash projective plane is Klein bottle hash projective plane. This one is weird. This will bother us for a while. Um, 
because it's somewhat saying we need to be careful at one point. So those two things, well, torus is supposed to be a, um, so let me just write that out. So here you have torus and projective plane, okay. And on the other side, you essentially just have projective plane three times by the lemma from the previous, let me just pull it up again, by this one here, right? Plane bottle is just two projective planes. So this tells us that my analogy, and this is supposed to be a torus, this tells us that my analogy is not quite right. It's not quite a prime number decomposition because there's this funny stupid fact that two times three is the same as three cubed. Right? That's a bit, little bit strange. So eventually we need to decide which one we prefer. This is the only ambiguity. And eventually we need to decide which one we prefer. But if I want to think of them as prime numbers, let me just give some symbols to make that clear. Let's say torus is two and this one is three, then we have this, this nonsensical identity, uh, two times three is three cubed. So this is the only case where we kind of diverge from this idea of uh, having a prime number decomposition. So we need to be a little bit careful at one point, and this is kind of the key. No other difficulty will show up. This is the only one. So just keep that in mind. And eventually we'll need to prefer one over the other, and we will call one of them the standard form. And it turns out that it's a little bit better to prefer the projective plane. So the right-hand side will be, so this one here will be our choice. And we kind of disregard the other. Cool. So let's just do it, and then, uh, then we're good. Well, here's the hash. We put them next to one another. I just did it in one step. So there you go. It's now in. Uh, so here's our little projective plane now. It's now in the surface. So I just cut out one step to make it fit on the slide. You cut it, you cut it again. So this is a bit difficult. It's probably much better to just to do it yourself on uh, uh, at your desk at home or something. You cut it again and eventually you will get this picture. So it's really just a lot of little steps moving the picture around until you had hit the projective plane, which is EE, just somewhere else and this pattern down here, which was our uh, Klein bottle. And this is really difficult. So if you try to imagine this in three space, if you want to do it, there is actually a YouTube video. Um, I won't play it, or well, it's actually pretty difficult. Ah, come on. So if you Google this, you want to see how that actually works, it's quite difficult to imagine. Um, do I have time to play it? Well, this is a five minute video and I only have three minutes left, so let's not do it. Let me just say, there is a video if you want to imagine how this works, but this is probably the most difficult calculation you ever do, and it's the one bugging point that destroys my, uh, my analogy with the, uh, um, yeah, so you just need to Google it, connected sum of projective plane and torus. And this destroys my idea of writing down uh, um, a prime number decomposition, so we need to be careful at one point. But let me wrap up. All you need to remember is we have this funny operation that I called connected sum. Uh, whatever, here's the surface, and here's the surface, and we hash them together. Exactly this little picture here. And it's actually really nice, up to this funny thing that is still on the, on, on the slide. And we will see, like next time I think, or, or maybe a little bit further down, that this gives us a prime number decomposition of surfaces, and then we can just write them down with three prime numbers, torus, disk, and projective plane, and then we can just write down the decomposition, and every surface will appear on that list, and it will appear uniquely on that list, which is just um, the classification we were looking for. Okay, thank you so much for coming today, and enjoy the rest of your day.